Hello, uh, I'm Tom Roble with the University of Kentucky Center for Applied Energy Research. Uh, I'm a research here in the cement lab, and um, I'm here today with my colleague, Ann uh, Oberlink. And what, we, what we're going to do is, is go through the procedures and the methodologies we use here at the center to measure posilonic activity. Um, we, we've developed this um, about eight years ago and, and have been refining it ever since. Uh, and uh, we use it on a routine basis. But it's, it's not a common technology. And if we're looking at uh, expanding the use of resistivity, uh, we thought we would make a quick video to share with you um, and uh, uh, sort of give you a clearer idea of what we're doing rather than reading a bunch of papers. So we'd like to take you through the whole process, beginning with uh, uh, mold and mold selection preparation through the kind of sands we use and then into uh, formation of prisms and finally in the measurements that, that we use to determine this method. Um, the uh, work uh, was initially for EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute. We did this on a grant about eight years ago. And one of the things we evaluated was um, strength index testing using the EN196 methodology, and we compared it with ASTM um, C618. Um, we found basically that the, the European method uh, was, a, was better. It gave a, a fewer, it, it didn't give any false positives like ASTM, and uh, um, it, it was a, a better method, but it took a long time uh, 90 days, and uh, it did have some failures in terms of producing some false positives, okay? So what this methodology uses is a, a prism mold instead of the more conventional, um, more conventional cube molds, which is something in, in all the labs. Um, this uh, particular prism mold is used uh, in, in uh, EN 196. It's also, it's also from uh, used in ASTM uh, C39 um, and 38. Okay, that's where these come in. For uh, um, it's used for molded prisms for the um, the single point um, uh, flexural test. Uh, what we do here, and I'll I'll, I'll show you this. Uh, this is sort of the way we prepare things at the center here. Um, this is gasketed. Um, this is your conventional. Uh, mold. This is gasketed with a, um, an eighth inch thick butyl gasket. This is a um, dur durometer 60. This is a real stiff, a real stiff um, uh, rubber uh, to keep it from cupping. But this this helps you with some of your older molds. You know, if, as you tighten these down, they develop this kind of curvature, uh, so this prevents leakage. You'll see as a mold gets older, you see some of the paste beginning to leak out. And, and that's a good way of fixing it. Um, this is, we also replace uh, those brass screws with stainless steel. Um, it keeps them from mushing up and, and preserves them in terms of mold life. Um, on this particular kind of mold, uh, you can't use uh, uh, an eighth inch. You have to use a, uh, a sixteenth of an inch. Again, durometer 60 or above. And uh, the reason is because you need to keep these register pins um, at least in some level of contact. And, and what they do is they force this mold down. We've tried a 32nd of an inch thick gasket, but it's too wrinkly. Um, also remember to grease, uh, use a little bit of Vaseline, uh, grease these edges, and then also the bottom here to keep, uh, to keep water from seeping out. So that's the basics when you start with the mold here. This is what, what we use for this method. Okay, now we'll go over and, and uh, discuss a little bit about the sand. In this procedure, what we're using here is, um, this is a EN196-1 uh, graded sand or standard sand. This is made, uh, this is made, particular one is made in France, um, down on the beach, um, in the southern part of France. Um, and it's different from the ASTM version of sand because this is a graded sand, but it's a very narrow size uh, range distribution. And it comes in these little sachets. It's, uh, um, they're very accurate. And because of the wide size distribution, there, there's a lot of riffling and things involved. And this company does a really good job. So we order it, comes in box uh, cases. 
It's not terribly expensive. Um, so it's one shot per test, and this will just do three of these molds that we do. And um, the, the uh, advantage of this particular material is that it has a better packing. A loose pack on the ASTM sand will be about 40% void volume. And uh, this will be around 24%. If you, if you vibrate, they'll both go down. But there is a the big difference. This large void volumes of the ASTM uh, sand causes some issues with packing. Anything that will change, that will fill in those voids, has a big effect on the strength. And um, this particular stand will kind of dampen some of that out. And we're trying to measure just the Pasolanic reaction. So we're trying to take all the variables that we can out of the equation. And this sand is very helpful. Also, it's very fast. You're not measuring. You just cut the bag and throw it in there. <laughs> Additionally, one thing we do is pre-mix um, the fly ash and the cement. Um, which is kind of helps with homogenation. Um, in this particular test, the EN 196 procedure we're following uses a water to cement of 0.5. So we're using uh, a 450 grams of cement and um, 225 milliliters of water, grams, rather grams of water. Um, that's a water cement of 0.5. That's pretty high. But uh, um, because of the, uh, um, uh, the because of the gradation of the sand, we, we can kind of get away with it, and it doesn't segregate the way that you would imagine. We follow the same uh, mixing protocols as ASTM, although we, we don't put it into the second gear. Um, just to avoid whipping a lot of air in there. Again, we're, we're trying to reduce the variables as much as we can. What we have here is a modified pull table. What we've done is bolted this on, uh, or clamped this onto this table. This is an old retired table. Um, if you're gonna try to do something with something you're using, I would put a rubber mat on it so you don't mar it up. But uh, the idea here is that the European test uses a jolting table. And uh, it's just, you'll see how it works in a bit. The uh, mortar is put in two lifts, and Anne will kind of demonstrate how this all works. You try to do about half on the first bolt jolt, a uh, series of jolts, and half on the, the, the next.
I'm going to do one or two to smooth it out. That's good. I just like to clean it up because it makes it easier for me. Oh, so hard and satisfying. <laughs> Can't be tired. Right. Smooth it. Okay. So then you will unhook it and then uh, cover it up. And it's, well, Tom will tell you, but it cures for 24-ish hours. You want to talk about the curing, Tom? Okay, at this point we set it aside, cover it up, um, and it cures for about a day before we demold it and then put the molds in the uh, misting cabinet. Now this particular technique, we just use the misting room, we don't put it in a saturated solution or anything. It, it works quite, quite nicely. Okay. This is our misting room. Um, this is where we, we keep the prisms. Um, right now, um, we're, we're conducting a study. We're using these in a study of uh, um, the uh, beneficiation of uh, fly ash from a bunch of um, uh, power plants in Kentucky. Uh, we're looking at air classification. Um, and uh, separating out the finest components with the coarser components. And we, we, this is one of the tests we use in addition to a, a series of other tests. But um, it's very handy. It, it's very indicative of how well the actual classification is going. Okay, so it's a useful tool in, um, it's a useful tool in research and other than just measuring postlonic activities with uh, um, the, the resistivity. Um, you can see an improvement in, in uh, um, the various grades of fly ash as we process them. Okay. Okay, and we'll go through the procedure we use for measurement. Um, we take the bars out. Uh, we usually, if they're dripping wet, we'll, we'll dry them off with a rag. That's about all. We don't wash them or anything. They're already in a misting cabinet. Um, we make a measurement. We start out with the coarse side or the top of the mold side first. And then we rotate the, the bars uh, in the same direction. There's a register mark on the bar, and that's always to the left. That way we can look at the data from, you know, long uh, in the past. And as, as the, uh, as the uh, um, resistivity increases, um, that, that can be uh, um, so, sort of helpful. Um, we'll, we do three bars up until 28 days. And then we break one of the bars, and I'll discuss that in a little bit later. Um, and then uh, that's, we use that for a strength index test. So we're doing both uh, the EN196 strength index test and the uh, resistivity uh, method at the same time in the same bars. And so you can kind of correlate back and forth and get a, a sense of what's going on. Um, so that's a control. That control was uh, um, yesterday that was at 6.1 kilo ohms per centimeter. What, what was it today, Ann? About 8.1. About 8.1. So that's in one day. It's increased by uh, resistivity in one day. Now, there is another. She'll do one more bar here. We use um, a non-conductive substrate um, to, to uh, because all our tables are steel. And there is, a, a, there is some effect of if you use a steel table uh, it in interferes with some of the resistivity, okay, which is only common sense. So uh, um, this is the second bar, and um, what's that one running above? 6.4. 6.4. 4. So that was 4.5. So you're really not getting any kind of uh, effect from the posilonic activity. But we'll pull out a couple of bars and just show you uh, a couple of measurements from some that are much older. This is an older sample. This one is uh, about 90 days. And uh, um, 
a little bit over 90 days. And you can see this is the control. It's uh, about, uh, it runs around 23 um, kilo ohms. And, and that's pretty typical. What will happen with the control is it flattens out. And it won't, th this won't change much for the next two years. Um, the uh, uh, other sample with the fly ash, though, You can see that one is about 102. So it's the fly ash has gone from about the same measurement of, of 2 to 6 to 8 to here it's at 102, or it's about 400% of the control, or four times the control. And you can see how effective uh, this particular measurement is. We will, always have, we will always have an extra prism. And we've been able to look at changes in the, uh, the Pasolanic reaction over a long period of time using this method. What we found is that uh, um, for about the first two to two and a half years, this reaction will continue. And um, the resistivity can go up quite high. Uh, it kind of demonstrates the importance of fly ash in, in producing really durable, uh, strong concrete uh, over a long period of time. About two and a half years in, it'll begin to flatten out but it'll continue to slowly increase, and maybe after about five, it pretty, five years, it pretty much stops. Um, th there's two, at this point, there's two, point, two ways of determining strength index. And I'll go into the physical measurement here just a little bit. Um, the the uh, um, measurement of resistivity is, is uh, very selective, and uh, I'll show you a graph at the end. We'll go through a little bit of that. Um, it's the other thing you can do to sort of verify this is also finish the strength index test, uh, the EN 196, um, and, uh, or, and or you can follow the procedures from C uh, 38 and 39, ASMC 38 and 39. Uh, what they do in these tests, though, is uh, um, the, the EN 196 and 38, you, you, take, you take one of the prisms, and this is a poorly formed prism, but uh, you take one of the prisms and, and you do a um, one point um, flex test on it, and then it'll, it'll break it in two, okay? And then you can take the two parts of, of this prism, and you can, you can break it um, using a jig. And this, this, is, this is one that we built in our machine shop. The little holes are for alignment purposes. And uh, this is cut out at 40.1, um, or 40 millimeters. And it, you would just set it in there like this. And, and uh, they specify that this jig has a gimbal, but there is a gimbal on the top of our, our instron, which fits on here. So uh, that's one way you can do it. Uh, you get a flexual data and um, you get some compressive uh, strength data from two specimens. However, um, we, we generally, um, we find that the flex data isn't all that interesting. So w what we do is here is we cut these into three 40 millimeter cubes. That gives us three tests from one bar. Um, and um, it's, uh, uh, it proves a little bit with the pre precision over two tests from one bar. Um, they use a ratio. Um, the Europeans use a ratio of the European test, just like the ASTM test. Pretty, much, pretty similar results, okay? Um, like I said, C30, uh, ASTM C39 describes the same procedures, the same breaking, and the same methodology. So, so that, that's about it. But I, I guess the proof of the pudding is, is in in some of the data. So we'll show you um, a couple a couple of, I'd like to show you some data from this testing and, and to, to kind of give you a fi uh, feel for how it all fits together. Here's an example of some of the data. Um, this is, uh, we've extrapolated, we, we've measured this over a period of 180 days. Um, what we're looking at here is, again, a, a classification test for some fly ash from a power plant. Uh, located in Kentucky. Um, the, what we've done here is use an air classifier to separate the, this uh, fly ash into a uh, coarse fraction, um, which is uh, in a fine fraction, and then of course there's as received. So we have the fly ash as we, we obtained it from the plant, and then the coarse and the fine fraction from an air classifier, actually an air centrifuge. The uh, fine materials are plotted on this chart in, in the gray, and you can see the much higher uh, resistivity um, compared to the as received. So 
we're seeing that level of beneficiation. Um, the strength index test for the materials, uh, the fine materials, is around 10% uh, higher, t 10 to 20% higher than the, uh, um, than the as received. So this particular method has beneficiated, beneficiated the ash. The red is, uh, like I said, as received. Now, now this um, yellow down here is, is the coarse material. And, and this is a uh, particular material is rich in, is rich in iron. And uh, it's not very posilonic, as you can see. After about uh, uh, 90 days, it almost stops in terms of uh, increasing. Um, the blue is the control. And it's very characteristic of a control. It, it, it starts out, uh, it takes off for the, next, for the first 20 days, and then it'll flatten right out. This won't change. This here is at... Uh, um, 167 days and it's uh, 26.2. Um, this up here is at uh, the same same period of time and it's at 120 um, uh, kilo ohms. So you can see the selectivity and also this particular the coarse material that's only weakly posilonic actually flunked uh, or did not pass the the um, strength index testing the the EN 196. Stre strength index. It came in at below 75% at 28 days and below 85% at 90 days. So this shows uh, showed an ability to um, discriminate between weakly posilonic materials and um, strongly posilonic materials and uh, improved posilonic materials. Okay. Well, thanks for for your attention, and and we hope uh, we made some sense uh, out of uh, this methodology for you and. Uh, um, um, again, uh, um, we appreciate it and uh, have a good day.